Hello again. Um, glad that you've all made it. Um, my job uh, for about 15 to 20 minutes is to talk about the current reform uh, efforts of the African peace and security architecture, um, the APSA, which I'm sure you're all familiar with intimately more than me. But my job is not to go over what the APSA is. You already know um, this. But to talk a little bit about the reform efforts that are underway. And I want to focus on a couple of general points at the um, beginning and then talk about three aspects of reform of the architecture, one to do with the African standby force and its current challenges. Uh, secondly, to look at what Paul Kagame um, is doing in terms of leading some general African Union reforms that relate to, in part, to the APSA. And then third, to look at what um, Donald Kabaruka is doing in terms of reforming the finance uh, and uh, monetary side of the African Union and the ABSA. But at a general level, I wanted to make a, a couple of statements at the, at the beginning. And the first assumption I'm going to make here is that a good, effective and well-funded African Union is not just good for Africa, it's good for the whole world. And so that's my starting assumption, that a good, effective, and well-funded African Union is not only good for Africa, it's good for everybody in the world. And in that sense, a well-funded and effective African Union is like a global public good for everybody. So it's not just Africans who benefit from a good and effective African Union, it's the world more generally. And so that's my, my first assumption. And my second general assumption is that the African Union, as you'll know, is going under a, a whole series of reforms at the moment. But this is completely normal for any international organization. These reform issues and a lot of the challenges that the African Union is facing are not unique to Africa. Many of them are the same at the United Nations, the European Union, or whatever. So although I'm going to say some quite critical things about the way that the African Union is reforming, it's not just an African Union problem. This is a problem or set of problems that face all big international organizations. Now my starting point here then with those uh, general comments is about the reform of the peace and security architecture in particular. And so from now on when I talk about the, um, the APSA, I'm going to mean those different sets of institutions there. The Peace and Security Council, the Military Staff Committee, the African Standby Force, all of these listed up here. But the first point to make about reform is that, as you'll know, those institutions on their own don't actually act or don't have the capability to act independently. They need and rely on all sorts of partnerships. And the, the first partnership there's a lot of little cogs to go up here. The first partnership is to do with the bureaucrats in the African Union Commission. We need to get the support and coherence and effective civil servants to make the APSA work. But secondly, it's also about the regional economic communities and the regional mechanisms in East Africa and North Africa in particular, because it's the Rex and the NARC and the regional mechanism, the EASF, that actually is putting together the regional standby brigades and the form police units and the like. But it's even more complicated than that because we've also got the African Union's 55 member states to coordinate. It's where you're all from, yeah? It's countries that actually have soldiers, police officers, civil servants and the like. So all of those are in green because they're meant to be working to the same objective and they're meant to be working coherently. But as you know, in reality, there's always a lot of conflict potentially between the member states and the RECs and the mechanisms. But it's more complicated than that as well because we also have to coordinate between other external partners, in particular the United Nations and the UN office at the African Union in Addis Ababa, but all the different UN agencies and uh, uh, organizations involved. It's more complicated than that because there's also the European Union to consider. The European Union has now paid over 2 billion euros into funding the uh, African peace and security architecture. So we've also got to coordinate and reform with the EU. And finally, it's even more complicated than that because we've also got a range of bilateral partners. The United States, France, the UK, China increasingly, other external actors. So my first point to you is that when I'm going to talk about reforming the APSA, we can't just talk about the sort of six institutions at the top. Because reforming those institutions, we have to reform and think about reforming all of these different partnerships as well. <coughs> 
with the civil servants in the commission, the re regional economic communities, which we're going to hear about, but also external partners, bilaterally and multilaterally. Now, with that as context, just to say a few general um, points as I see the context for reforms at the moment, I think a few things are going on here. First, we've got to remember that the APSA is still not finished. We haven't finished building this set of institutions, and yet, ever since they started in 2002, we've been in perpetual crisis mode. We've been trying to put out fires on the continent, different numbers, right? But ever since we've started, this has been running to catch up. Secondly, we're at a time now where we've got record numbers of peacekeepers in Africa, both from the United Nations, the African Union, but also ECOWAS and ECAS occasionally and other actors. So we're at a record number of peace operations now. And that means, as a result, thirdly, what I call partnership peacekeeping has become the norm. Most of the time now, when we want to respond to a crisis in Africa, we don't respond through a single organization. Instead, we talk about partnerships, and those partnerships can vary depending what the crisis is and what we're trying to achieve. The key element that's come out of this is the word or the phrase strategic partnership. How do we build strategic partnerships between these different sets of institutions? Then the fourth point for context, I think, is just trends in armed conflict on the continent. Unfortunately, uh, since 2010, all of the lines of the conflict charts have been going up. We've seen more organized violence in Africa rising again since 2010. It's not as high as during the 1990s when things were really much worse, but after a period of things getting better, the last seven years have seen us move in the, the wrong direction. And then finally, um, the AU is still divided on some key issues. And part of the problem we're having with the reform agenda is that not all the AU's member states agree on what we should be trying to achieve and what we should be trying to do. So if you look at cases like um, Burundi or South Sudan, you'll find you know, differences of opinion between the RECs, the African Union, the external partners about how to engage. So I think that context is really quite difficult and it's important for us to remember that when we think about the challenges of, um, of reform. Now, as I said, I want to focus on three ongoing reform efforts at the moment. Firstly, the African standby force and how are things going in relation to that? Now, I want to start with the good news here. And again, a number of you will have lived through the building of um, the African standby force, I'm sure. But a couple of things to mention. Um, number one, of course, is we've at least made it to officially full operational capability now. Since the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, officially the African Union has declared the standby force operational, but we all know that in reality that's not quite the case. There's a couple of ways you can think about the limitations here. First of all, North Africa, obviously. Really what we mean here is potentially four regions are operational. Western, Central, Eastern, and Southern, but North Africa is just not even um, in, the, in the game yet when it comes to the, um, the NARC. The second issue is it's not also really fully operational in the sense that not all the regions have been fully tested yet with their regional standby brigades. Now, that is happening quickly. If you think about ECAS uh, in Central African Republic, for example, there's been deployments there. If you think of ECOWAS with its missions in Guinea-Bissau or the Gambia um, just recently, there's been obviously key developments in West Africa. Uh, the debates that are going on in Southern Africa at the moment about the, the Lesotho mission. Um, I understand in a couple of weeks we might de be deploying um, troops from South Africa, Namibia, Swaziland, I think, and maybe Angola into um, Lesotho. So we've got mixed records in terms of the different regions there. But I think the important thing to mention is that all of the regions are still figuring out some problems with various critical uh, enabling capabilities. If you think about strategic lift and aviation assets, for example, we're in short supply. If you think about logistics support and mission support to sustain operations in the field, we're struggling. If you think about uh, intelligence gathering, specialized engineering, medical support, in all these crucial specialist areas, we're not sure really where the African standby force stands uh, at the moment. The second area of challenge we've got with the standby force is to do with its design and the scenarios that it was designed to um, respond to. 
So we know, I'm sure you've all heard about these six scenarios, yeah, that we, we have for the, um, the standby force. Now, they being designed in 2003, they focused on quite, I think, a traditional sort of civil war type of template for response. We were talking about governments fighting rebels, and we were talking about peace operations coming in and trying to transition some sort of political settlement, probably with a transitional power sharing arrangement between the rebels and the government, and then the peacekeepers would leave. The trouble is, if you think of the wars against Boko Haram, or the Lord's Resistance Army, or Al-Shabaab, or Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, it's very difficult to see a political settlement to end those wars. It's very difficult to think of a power sharing arrangement between the Nigerian government and Boko Haram. So our peacekeepers are in a slightly different context because we're not sure how these wars are going to end. And that means we've got to think about how would we revise the scenarios that we built for the standby force. And I've, I've put a list up here. If you think of those groups I've just mentioned, transnational terror organizations, they don't fit into any of the scenarios really. If you think about the climate change crisis that is affecting parts of Africa, environmental degradation, pastoralist versus um, farmer um, conflicts, cattle raiding, these types of things, they don't fit into the ASF framework either. If you think about organized criminal groups, we also have no explicit response to them in this framework, yet we know organized criminal groups have been really important in supporting Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, or Boko Haram, or Al-Shabaab. There's very little to say about maritime security as well. So we know that piracy, both off the coast of Somalia or in the Gulf of Guinea, and other maritime security issues are problems, but the standby force doesn't address any of these things. And finally, think of the case of Ebola. Where is the next Ebola outbreak going to happen, and how and where will our, our sort of military and police forces play a part in that response? So I think this second area of reforming the standby force means we've really got to reform and revise our, our scenarios. What role do we see soldiers and police playing in the next Ebola pandemic, or in combating organized crime? These are the questions I think we've got to think about. Now the second area of reform I wanted to talk about was the one that's being led at the moment by Rwanda's president, uh, Paul Kagame. Um, I'm not gonna go through in detail all this list, but as you may know, uh, after a while of thinking about this, in January this year, Paul Kagame released his report, which was a very critical assessment of the African Union and its politics, its finance, and its managerial um, practices. And from my perspective as an outside academic, I mean, I think it's a pretty accurate list. I think Kagami's uh, document here hit on some key issues. He said, excuse me, he said number one, yeah, the African Union has a real problem with implementation. It passes a lot of communiques and makes a lot of declarations, but it has real trouble implementing its decisions on the ground. As a result, secondly, the African Union has lost a lot of relevance to Africa's citizens. How many ordinary Africans see the African Union's policies making a real difference in their lives on a day-to-day -day basis? This is going to be not many if they can't implement its decisions. He said also it's a fragmented organization because it tries to focus on too many things. And he said as well it's a hamstrung or it's a weakened organization because it relies on external funding. As I'll talk about in a minute, over 90% of the peace and security activities of the AU are financed by foreign partners, which has real uh, detrimental effects for ownership and credibility of the AU. The commission as well is limited. There's about a thousand or so AU commission bureaucrats, yet we know that's nowhere near enough to do all the things that we need the African Union to do. And then, as I've mentioned already, the partnerships. We've still got a whole lot of messy relationships between the African Union, the regional economic communities, the external partners, and the individual member states. So you won't be able to see or read maybe all this um, next slide, but this is a, a sort of summary of what Kagame has said he's trying to do then in the, the reforms. The important thing here is that there are four key elements to Kagame's reforms of the African Union, several of which are relevant to the peace and security architecture. The first one up there um, is the focus. The AU is trying to do too many things, he said, and so we should really prioritize on just four key issues. 
what he's called political affairs, peace and security, economic integration, and then Africa's global agenda. How does Africa speak with one voice on the international stage? And those four things are enough. That will keep us busy for as far as we can see. The second element of his reforms then, he says we've got to change our institutional setup and our bureaucratic um, organization at the union. You see there, there are eight commission directorates, 11 African Union organs, 20 high level committees, 21 departments, 31 specialized agencies. This has got to change. And he recommends that we slim these down again to focus on those four priority um, topics. Thirdly, he said, we've got to make an effective and efficient African Union, which means getting a more effective bureaucracy, partly in Addis Ababa, but also elsewhere in the continent. And I think the key here is that we've got to make the African Union Commission a real professional and meritocratic bureaucracy. Of course, the African Union is a political organization, and of course, there's going to be a politicization of its appointments. But we've got to start hiring young Africans and giving them a pathway, a career pathway, based on their skills, their intellect, their abilities, and give them a meritocratic pathway to have a real career at the African Union. At the moment, too often people's careers get sort of stopped or shunted aside after five or six years because they hit political obstacles or glass ceilings. And then the fourth area is to do with funding. And that's what I want to spend uh, the last bit of my talk talking about is the, the financial reform of the African Union. And this is directly related to the peace and security architecture again. And this, as you'll probably know, um, led by another Rwandan, um, Dr. Donald Kabaruka, who was uh, Rwanda's for formerly Rwanda's finance minister and head of the um, African Development Bank. He is now the, the high representative, the champion, if you like, of the peace fund and financial reform of the union. Why is this crucial? I think for a couple of reasons that I put up there. In the, if the African Union and African member states can't pay for most of their own security and peace activities, this has a number of problems, right? First of all, it undermines the sustainability of the institution. If we don't know where the money's come from, we can't plan predictably. Secondly, though, it also undermines the ownership credentials, I think, of the African Union and its member states. If you take something seriously in life, you're willing to devote your time and your effort and your resources to it. So if I take something serious, I don't know, I take my daughter seriously, for example, right? So I'm willing to invest time and effort, but also money in my daughter's education, upbringing, etc. I'm not sure you can say you're really serious about something if you're not willing to invest money into it. And this is the problem that the African Union has. It's not been willing to invest money into its own peace and security architecture. So it's not entirely clear to outsiders if it's serious or not. And if you're not serious yourself, you can only expect outsiders to help you for a uh, sort of part of the way, I suppose, or part of the time. So it undermines credibility after a while. If you say you're serious about something but don't pay for it. And then this leads us to the African Union's budgets at the moment, which as you'll know probably already, are split up into the three in the green pie chart at the top. The AU has generally speaking three types of budgets. It's operating budget to run the AU commission and its, its staff, its program and activities budget. And then the big one is its peace and security activities, which are paid for out of a separate um, pot. Now, Donald Kabaruka, I think, and his important reforms have said, how do we find a sort of sustainable and predictable level of finance? And so, as you know, the last couple of years, we've seen these declarations made where the African Union is going to pay for 100% of its operating costs by 2020, 75% of its program budget and program costs by 2020, and 25% of the peace and security activities by 2020. So it's important to say right at the beginning that even with Kabaruka's proposals of reform, the African Union is not going to be able to finance everything itself. It's still only looking to pay one quarter of the peace and security bill by 2020. So it's going to have to rely on, for three quarters of that, external partners. The UN, the EU, the US, the Chinese, whoever. But the point here is, if the AU can show willing and that it's serious about investing up to 25%, then this should encourage other donors and other actors to support the African Union as well. 
And again, as you'll probably know, Kabaruka's proposal or solution here was to put a, a small levy on imports, what they're calling eligible imports into Africa. So this is gonna be a sort of automatic uh, mechanism that finance ministries and central banks will deal with. And they're gonna make sure that 0.2% of every one of these transactions drops some money into the African Union's peace fund. And then with that money, we're gonna spend that on different elements of the APSA, early warning and preventative diplomacy, peace operations like Amazon or the mission in Gambia or Lesotho or wherever. Uh, and that way, over time, the theory would be that as Africa's economies grow over time, so the 0.2% will grow over time as well, and there will be more and more money in the Peace and Security Fund as Africa grows economically. Now at the moment, I understand about 12 African countries have actually started to implement this mechanism already. So we're starting to see by the end of this year some of the early sort of um, signs of more monies going in the, the pot. But I think if we were to sort of look back on the last 15 years of the African Union, I would say this, these decisions about finance and, and Donald Kabaruka's reform effort, I think this is the single most important decision that the African Union has taken since it was created. And if we really can get an African Union that is effective and fully funded with the help of the partners that I mentioned at the beginning, yeah, the UN, the EU, US, France, etc., the partnerships are still going to be crucial. But if we can get that funded and effective African Union, that's not going to be good just for Africa. That will also be good for the rest of the world as well. And that's why I started by saying, I think my assumption is a good and strong African Union is good for Africa, but it's also good for the world. Because the world has an interest in dealing with Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram and Ebola and HIV AIDS, etc. These are not just African problems and issues. So we as outsiders want to see a stronger and more effective African Union. And I think our governments, our bosses, are more likely to put money in to support it if these financial reforms go through. So that's why I think they're, they're so important. And I'll stop there.